Uh, the title of my presentation is Agile Education for Turbulent Times. So I'm not expected, I hope, to explain what the turbulent times are because all those expressions were already used here. And uh, Agile was also used, uh, although in management science it's, uh, it's usually attracted to some methods of uh, project management. Uh, but actually, uh, it's being, uh, uh, its understanding and application is being extended to the use of any sort of activities. It uh, could be agile organizations, agile processes. It, it means that uh, you have to be always uh, focused uh, on, on, the, on the topic uh, you want to progress uh, in. And uh, regardless of the constraints, uh, uh, you have to uh, manage uh, those matters and to bring to the, the success uh, results. Um, well, let's start with a very brutal truth. That is a perception, uh, the social perception of, on what is really going on. Uh, first of all, uh, we observe the revolution for zero. Again, I'm not going to repeat uh, everything on revolution for zero, but uh, the contemporary education for employability, so it means the ability to be employed, uh, correspond with the change of the global business landscape. It's not only the science, uh, it's uh, mainly the business landscape that is a contingency uh, for employment and contingency for producing wealth and, and, and so on. Uh, Business world uh, is characterized by the competitive rules that have been set up and uh, they have a certain inertia. So we cannot just overcome them. The, the world is not empty. There, there are always forces uh, who govern <laughs> in the, on the business landscape and we have to, to stick to them or to understand them and eventually to overcome some of those uh, constraints. Uh, what has been noticed a uh, long, long time ago, it means uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the, the second millennium uh, in uh, INSEAD, uh, it's uh, Rita Madgrath, but also, also other uh, researchers, that uh, in business there is nothing stable nowadays and permanently we have uh, um, to do with the transient character of competitive advantages. There is no space for everybody. There is a space only for leaders. Others are laggards and uh, they unfortunately will not win on the marketplace. So uh, how to deal with the transient competitive advantages and permanently shortening business cycles, product cycles, uh, industry cycles, uh, because uh, it means uh, that uh, for investors, <coughs> uh, if you invest, you cannot have time for cashing out all your investments. So it's expensive, but the results are uncertain. So uh, again, we have to deal with this uh, logic of uh, financial world. And um, again, if we are looking at the technology, te technology uh, itself only um, means costs and the promise that something will be changed for the better. But the profits and benefits are in the society and they are on the market. So that is a platform for exchanging uh, you know, for goods for, uh, for money. And um, <coughs> there is a time uh, to strategic design of the future. So we, we have to think in terms of strategy rather, uh, how the organization should look like in the future and how to make the smart use of smart technology. Because technology may be smart, but the society may be totally lost and not profiting from its uh, full potential. Um, and the anatomy of uh, transient advantages, so those short-term gains, uh, gains that we could uh, eventually have, is based, um, as it was pointed out in one of the presentations, on the decent evaluation of risks and operational excellence following every good idea. And I've been I've been teaching for years the strategy courses yeah, at the executive MBA programs that also on master programs. But after some time, I s uh, simply uh, realized that uh, the uh, strategy itself is empty if it's not followed by disciplined execution. So the execution brings results. 
Then, uh, actually, I'm teaching uh, operations management and project management. Uh, so process management, process improvement, uh, project type of uh, organizing activities, all forms and combinations of those two forms uh, to make things uh, happen. And um, in every organization, there is a big problem, um, first of all, to generating initiatives and then to executing them, but uh, there is a certain order required. What are the priorities in front of uh, uh, the needs and the constraints uh, that we encounter? So every company uh, from the management point of view has to create or design a sort of pipeline. What will be first, well, what will be next, what resources to, should be prepared or generated uh, to start some, some initiatives, and this is the, the management uh, process and, and ordering. However, if we look at the technology, first of all, we have to understand the social impacts and social understanding and, and society being prepared or not prepared to uh, acquire the new uh, inventions um, and the new sometimes genius uh, uh, um, uh, ideas. Uh, from the point of view of the economy, there is a strong perception about the market pressure. Everybody understands those competitive pressures and how the market uh, creates the pressures on manufacturing companies and what is the expectation? That you always have to be close to your customer. You have to create value to your customer. But the customer does not want to pay a lot. So it's uh, close to zero <laughs> price for something that is really creating value. So just uh, try to make the gem in your brains uh, how to put those uh, two ends together. It's really a, a mystery how many companies due to scalability and very intelligent designs uh, uh, are still able to, to deliver basing on this uh, competitive uh, premises. Uh, there is also the, the harsh digital race in investments, but if you are a little bit too late, then there are zero returns. So who will pay for that? Who will lose for that? Who are the, the, the shareholders of such initiatives and uh, uh, how um, the companies can build trust if they are too, a little bit too late to catch this train of progress? So the question is, uh, where, where is the money <laughs> in all these processes? Uh, how to cash out all those initiatives? And uh, there are, of course, some other concepts. Do we still need money? Perhaps uh, there will be something uh, better than money. Money is very universal metrics of, of success, of cost, of progress, so it's, it, it's very good. But uh, there are also concepts of sharing economy. But you don't need money, you are just, you are just exchanging uh, favors, services, products, everybody contributes. Uh, so quite utopian concepts, but in small societies uh, they, they used to work. But uh, more difficult are social concerns that the technology will replace people, so there will be no employment uh, uh, for people, and uh, if you take the statistical metrics, uh, the population is not consisting only from geniuses and uh, hard-working people and capable of change and, and so on. It's, it's a statistical spread of talent, statistical spread of uh, um, effectiveness and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, if the unemployment uh, uh, is going to raise, uh, it will lead uh, eventually to poverty and social exclusion of these people. What will be the consequences of social unrest? On the economy, on technology development, on creating uh, the GDP growth, and there is another um, uh, this nice phenomenon that I like, it's a new type of economy, and it's called economics of happiness. And according to this uh, economics of happiness, I'm the closer to Neantra's presentation of leisure, <laughs> leisure, happiness, something that is not a business uh, type of uh, uh, category, but, but it works. Uh, so according to some, some research, and I refer it uh, actually to the Polish landscape, that about 18% of actively engaged uh, people, uh, uh, there's 18% of people who are actively engaged in this process, uh, about the same of actively disengaged people who never apply for a job, uh, apply for a job. They are not interested. Somebody else works for them, so uh, uh, even if they, they are educated, they, they don't want to work. What about the rest? They are working, but they are very unhappy. They are doing the job they hate. 
So uh, perhaps uh, this is also a sort of deviation uh, in terms of how to organize our, our life. Artificial intelligence is absolutely, you know, <laughs> moving us uh, to, to think deeper. And um, of course, it's not a new phenomenon. It, uh, the, the term has been coined in uh, 1956, so uh, the cons famous conference in, in Dartmouth. But uh, the, the, fully, um, the, the first uh, really um, important applications uh, were not uh, even reaching the, the, the ten, ten years. And uh, I don't want uh, to explain, you know, the whole uh, genesis and construction of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but what we observe, there is a permanent development from the technology point of view and uh, from the possible um, use uh, that uh, the society can profit from uh, of AI waves. Uh, they, have, uh, uh, they are being developed uh, simultaneously, however, with different pace and with different uh, uh, interactions among uh, one of them. So I think that it wasn't mentioned yet. So the, the first wave of um, uh, AI is Internet AI. So in, in many companies, we already have it in, in all the countries, I think that you know it that uh, uh, all the data that is uh, available by internet, so in the digital form, could be labeled. If it's uh, labeled, uh, uh, then it could be profiled. And many companies already have started uh, uh, to uh, day for data profiling. Uh, they sell the data that they come, uh, they uh, gather on the on the platforms. Uh, and uh, the rise of such companies is absolutely amazing. One of the, such a companies is a cloud technologist company. Uh, it's a company set up by uh, uh, our school graduate, 33 years old uh, young man. He employs uh, 55 uh, people and uh, the company is one of the five global leading companies in data profiling. So they query raw materials from the digital space, from all the computers, uh, handsets, wherever the signal is uh, in the digital form, they can uh, query it, and then uh, they, uh, through using the big data and machine learning um, and neurosciences, deep learning, they uh, create profiles that they sell to uh, advertising companies. And they totally change the, the, the business landscape because uh, uh, if we ask them, who is your competitor? And they say, well, it's, it's really difficult uh, to tell because uh, uh, all these uh, five uh, leading companies uh, in the world are exchanging uh, information. So uh, if the cloud technology is using the information that has been gathered by another one, they, uh, at the end, uh, they make a clearing of in megabytes, not in dollars, not in any money issue, but in megabytes. Megabytes, and then the rest will be uh, will be monetized. So our students are extremely interested how to set up such a company, how to be successful. The, the only deficiency is that uh, there may be just a few companies of this of, of this type. Uh, they are fast cre fastly created, but there is no more space. The platform is so uh, it has such a large capacity that uh, that they could grow uh, using their own resources. Not too many space for, for others. Uh, the second um, wave uh, is uh, business um, artificial intelligence that collects data on facts, processes, and allows for decision making and super deep diagnostics in such uh, areas like, like banking, like, like medicine. So when you have to put together the big uh, uh, sets of data that the human brain can hardly digest and, and, see, uh, and see the clear picture. And then, so the next uh, wave is uh, the perception, uh, artificial intelligence. So there are thousands, or even millions of sensors and devices used in uh, simple city and uh, home applications. And uh, it is called the trillion sensor economy. Um, it's used for speech interfaces, for super smart assistants. You know, we are, uh, especially the aging population may have problems with memory and the super assistant that is a technology a solution uh, will help you uh, to reminding you what is important and uh, collecting data and, uh, and uh, trying to help you in any, any situation. There are also computer vision applications like uh, quality inspections in the companies. So it's, it's, it's very important, very precise and detailed uh, quality inspections. In the fourth wave uh, that is uh, actually being developed is autonomous uh, AI. It's integrating all previously mentioned ones. 
and it's uh, sensing, responding, and uh, making decisions, but also manipulating. So it will be much more intelligent that we uh, can, can expect from the machine. And it is, uh, it, 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 it is already used, and it may be used in automated assembly line and warehouses uh, together with all type of, uh, of robotics. Uh, there are three major uh, improvements expected to bring uh, t a trillion uh, of um, dollars uh, worldwide GDP in 2030. And uh, those uh, benefits that, that are expected or ways that we will use uh, those technologies uh, uh, could be just put into two sets. First, that you can automate transactions, both physical transactions and cognitive transactions. And the second group, the second set, uh, is uh, augmenting our innovative uh, capabilities and also leadership capabilities. So it's uh, support of, uh, of those, uh, those two. Um, in automations, for instance, there is an automation of, of management data query, data analytics, AI used to optimize activity, to optimize processes, uh, to optimize the whole businesses, and also automation of operations so that it refers to robotics, to IoT, to 3D printing, analytics, uh, and uh, it's used to automate and automize operations, so it could be done any, anywhere. Augmentation means uh, something that is, goes beyond uh, the normal uh, skills, okay, thank you. And um, automated leadership, it means that technology uh, augments uh, unique human qualities uh, to shape the future of business, of process, uh, and so on. It's also fortifying our creative uh, processes and uh, design thinking with the use of uh, insights, uh, with the use of uh, CAD CAM technologies and also uh, simulations. So this automation and augmentation uh, help us to understand what could be the potential benefits and how to explain them to people who are afraid of, because we cannot just oscillate between hope and fear. Uh, we should be pragmatic and uh, to make the, uh, the use. Uh, how to make it happen? Um, it means that uh, there is uh, the time when the company had uh, one strategy is over. Uh, it should be the permanent uh, uh, continuous formulation and undertaking of strategic operational uh, initiatives to build and use numerous transient advantages because you never know how long it will last. Uh, so you should be prepared for uh, with, with abundance of, of such initiatives. And um, the position of the companies will depend from the evolving portfolios of, uh, of uh, initiatives and advantages that assure the continuity of existence and eventually winning on the marketplace on one of the leadership positions that uh, um, continue your work. And thus uh, uh, the strategy becomes a fuzzy uh, phenomenon and not uh, something uh, tough and uh, it, the strategy will be customer and opportunity focused so it's not the certainty that you will win and certainty what you should do uh, so um, this uh, disruption also uh, erodes uh, the industry's uh, um, uh, definitions and the traditional industries are being disrupted too, so, so are the, the products uh, they used to, pr to, pr to manufacture before. And the decision-making system should be prepared uh, to, for the very fast actions, not just decision, but also putting the decisions um, uh, into action. And the delayed decision and delayed actions have completely no business sense. And this is a, no, a new strategic normality. Possible traps, first mover advantage, not necessarily. Sometimes uh, you get trapped because it's not a good idea. So you have always to be prepared with some exit strategies. Some companies uh, used to think that they are always the best. Something, uh, some companies think that only the top quality matters. No, sometimes it's uh, not needed. It costs too much. Uh, something cheaper of lower quality will do, will do the job much, much better. Uh, there are some also thinking about no available resources or something that they are wise spots that the idea is excellent, but it does not fit to our speciality. So it's just an idea. It's uh, um, abandoned. Uh, some companies are rather focused on building empires than on doing business and satisfying client, client needs and sporadic innovation. So they are the, the new rules um, the, of the game. So we have to, first of all, focus on building value. 
think in terms of domains, not industries, uh, uh, set up the issue and uh, allow for experimentation because there is no certainty. Um, we have also to set up new measures of uh, evaluation, especially of uncertain uh, um, actions. And uh, experiences should be used uh, problem solving and not imitation of somebody else's uh, uh, solutions. Uh, very important is building relationships and networks. Uh, and it's not recommended to, to, uh, to forget about innovating and from time to time to undergo radical restructuring of everything because it means a, a big uh, hole in. Uh, in, in revenues. So we have to learn soft, healthy exit strategies from the ideas that become obsolete and you know, in a timely manner. And uh, what is also important is a systematic engagement in the early stage of innovations when you already have the feeling that this, this is your field. We have to experiment, learn and make the next uh, step. Uh, if I may just give you one example, how I'm, how I'm teaching students uh, the operations management course. Uh, they are international students and the textbooks on operations management are as thick as that. Uh, I have learned that they do not uh, read them, they do not learn from them, uh, so I switched, uh, totally switched the roles. And uh, if there is a syllabus with topics uh, from uh, uh, covering all the important uh, issues uh, within the operations management pile, they have to create teams and to teach all others what they have discovered, but not using the old uh, and obsolete textbooks, but digging into the internet, into articles that they usually omit, <laughs> they, they don't uh, read the uh, business journals. And they have to find the, uh, the best uh, practices, uh, best practicing uh, enterprise in this respect, like, like for instance, flexibility management or new product development, or location or, or whatever. And the one that is a big, big failure. Sometimes it was a famous company who failed because it was uh, not designed properly. I have learned that uh, uh, our students, uh, it's not only Polish students, they are international students really from all over the world. Uh, they are lacking curiosity. They are not digging deep into the material. Uh, they are not too much interested uh, with uh, uh, upgrading their knowledge if they do not see the sense, practical sense for them, and they do not know how to work in teams. So uh, when you uh, sh share the responsibility for, for, for the presentation, uh, they, they also other students are asked for feedback, and they give the points for them. And they also evaluate their own conduct within, within the team. And uh, then, um, this uh, responsibility makes them really uh, dig uh, uh, deeper and harder and try to show up in front of the whole group. Uh, of course, it does not uh, replace the good textbooks, but, but the textbooks nowadays always become obsolete. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.